Today I'm simply going to read from Theodore Dodge Hannibal. I'm just going to read. I'm not going to make any judgments. We'll save that for later. This is chapter 26. Aemilius Paulus and Varro, Spring, 216 BC. In 216 BC, Aemilius Paulus and Terentius Varro were consuls, and Rome had nearly 100,000 men in the field. Aemilius was a man of the highest character. Varro was of low birth, and without those qualities we must esteem. Hannibal and the Roman army lay facing each other at Geronium until May. He had tried to lure the consuls into an ambuscade or to battle without success. The Romans were gaining in ability, and the number of veterans in the ranks was now considerable. The vicinity of Geronium had been eaten up. Hannibal must move to new quarters, for he had not the aid of the population to bring him supplies. There was a great depot of breadstuffs at Cannae, south of him on the Alphidus, which the Romans were carelessly guarding. By a secret and clever march, Hannibal seized on Cannae, the consuls were at a loss what to do. Cannae was in the Apulian plain where Hannibal could make efficient use of his cavalry. But the Senate advised another battle if it could be had on equal terms, and the consuls marched to Canusium, south of the Alphidus, and camped six miles from the Carthaginian. Here a few days later, Varro crossed swords with Hannibal and won certain advantage. This whetted the, his appetite for a pitched battle, much to Hannibal's delight. The Romans had 80,000 foot and 7,000 horse to Hannibal's 40,000 foot and 10,000 horse. They had also established a small camp on the north bank to protect the foragers. Both sides prepared for battle. Next year, BC 216, Varro and Paulus were consuls. Varro was the popular, Aemilius the Senate's candidate. As praetors, Pomponius Matho, Publius Furius, Marcellus Postumus were chosen, and the two latter were respectively assigned to Sicily and Gaul. The Senate made unusual exertions to raise troops and put nine Roman and nine allied legions, each of 5,000 foot into the field making with the horse 98,000 men, a much larger force than Rome had so far reached in the Second Punic War. Still, the cavalry was less than Hannibal's, and vastly inferior to it, and cavalry was the winning arm. The Scipios in Spain were, con were continued in command, and the expedition against Africa and from Syracuse was planned. One of the new legions was assigned to the Praetor Postumius, whose orders on leaving for Gaul were to create such a diversion as might result in the Gallic auxiliaries in Hannibal's command being recalled to the defense of their own country. The proconsul Servilius was ordered by Aemilius to undertake no operations in force against Hannibal, but to exercise his men in slight skirmishes and exchanges with the Carthaginians so as to lend them confidence and aplomb, a duty which Servilius apparently performed with skill and success. The troops this year all took a new oath, never to fly from the enemy, never to leave the ranks except to get weapons or palisades, to kill an enemy or save a fellow citizen. Rome was now in earnest, if ever. The new consuls were the antipodes of each other. Aemilius was an aristocrat, a man of noble character and fine bearing, and a good soldier, courageous but discreet who, as consul three years before, had commanded with credit in Illyria and brought that war to a successful issue. He had intelligence enough to approve the Fabian policy. Varro was a plebeian, son of a butcher, and is generally represented as brutal and common dem demagogue. Polybius calls him base and worthless. But the historians are apt to be partial to the patricians, and Varro had given, and later on gave again, signs of ability Though no doubt he was open to the gravest criticism, and according to some, to the charge of lacking stomach to fight to the bitter end. Hannibal remained in his camp at Geronium until May, and the Roman army still encamped where it had been all winter in his front. 
backing on the foothills for protection from the Numidian cavalry. The recklessness bred of Minucius' successes had quite dissipated by Minucius' later failure, but Servilius, under Servilius, the condition of the Roman soldiery had constantly improved. Why Hannibal remained at this point for so long, as well as many other interesting circumstances, are left without explanation by the historians, who only speak of waiting for the crops to yield forage and rations. Contrasting the Carthaginians' long period of rest in winter quarters with Alexander's abnormal activity, which knew no seasons, no obstacles, no difficulties, these apparent delays appear strange in a man whom we know to possess no less real energy than the great Macedonian, and to whom at first blush we assume time to have been of the essence of success. His army had now enjoyed a long respite from work, and he must himself have been anxious for battle. During the winter and spring, there had been frequent outpost combats, but nothing of which the historians make more than casual mention. But in these combats, the Roman legionaries gradually acquired experience and hardihood. They were transforming themselves from raw levies to seasoned troops, and the number of men who had seen service was fast increasing. We can only guess that Hannibal's time had been taken up in negotiating with the Roman allies of southern Italy, and that he was waiting for he was awaiting developments. Nothing shows the extraordinary force of character of the man better than the fact that, with such heterogeneous elements as those of which his army was composed, he experienced no difficulty in keeping his troops in heart and health during the winter, a season which always prejudicial to discipline, owing to the enforced idleness, to the impossibility of finding work for the men to do. While well, in this vicinity, Hannibal tried one or two more stratagems to gain an advantage over the Romans. After a certain affair of the outposts in the spring of 216 BC, in which he may have suffered somewhat more loss than the enemy, though probably not 1,700 killed to the Romans 100, as Livy states, Hannibal withdrew from camp during the night, the men bearing naught but their weapons and leaving their tents and equipage in disorder as if the Carthaginians had suddenly retired in panic. Moving off to a distant distance, he concealed his infantry in the cover of some hills, his cavalry nearby, and his baggage train beyond. He hoped that the Romans would plunder his camp and that he might take advantage of the disorder thus engendered. He had left campfires burning in order to lead the Romans to believe that he had intended to persuade them that he was still in camp so that he might retreat to a greater distance before they caught up with him. The Roman generals came dangerously close to falling into the trap. The army had been ordered into line, but the consuls were restrained partly by fear of a ruse, partly by the bad appearance of the sacrificial victims. For one of these annoying omens proved of use. For once these annoying omens proved of use. As a rule, unless in the hands of a man like Alexander who could turn the priests to good account and lead the oracles by his own better judgment, they were Unmitigated, an, un, an unmitigated nuisance, a hindrance to all military operations. In this instance, before the legions actually advanced, news was brought in from the front that the Carthaginians were lying in ambush beyond the hills. Such a stratagem appears to us trivial indeed, but ancient, sor sor ancient history is full of such, both successes and failures. And we consider, for example, how Hannibal escaped from the Faler Falernian plain by his stratagem of the oxen, and what was and what the conditions of ancient warfare were the originality of such proceedings and their not infrequent singular success excites our admiration even in modern war less good ruses have lain at the foundation of great victories